I'm Tracy Sable. Tonight on EWTN News Nightly, former president on trial. Donald Trump appears in court in a case involving a possible hush money payment. We have a report from New York. Middle East conflict. World leaders react after Tehran launches drones and missiles into Israel. Sharing the faith. Pope Francis says there is something simple we can do to draw closer to Christ. And Green Machine. The winner of the Masters Golf Tournament credits his victory to something other than his clubs and his caddy. We'll explain. These stories and more tonight. From EWTN, the Global Catholic Network, this is EWTN News Nightly. Thank you for being with us. We begin with a day that will go down in the history books as Donald Trump became the first former president to face a criminal trial. Before entering court, Trump made this declaration. This is political persecution. This is a persecution like never before. Nobody's ever seen anything like it. And again, it's a case that should have never been brought. He is facing 34 counts of falsifying business records to cover up a sex scandal while serving as president. If convicted, he could be sentenced to four years in prison. For more, let's go to AP International affiliate correspondent Philip Crowther, who is outside of the courthouse. Philip, good to be with you. So tell us more about this case that Trump is facing. Well, it's considered the maybe the least serious of the four criminal cases that the former president faces right now, and the only one most likely to go to a criminal trial before the election date in November of this year. This is, in shorthand, called the hush money case. But really, it's about whether Donald Trump falsified records to hide the fact that he might have been hiding a sexual affair with a former uh, adult movie actress. Uh, that is something that this jury is supposed to essentially decide upon. At what time, we don't know yet. This is a trial that is expected to last around six weeks. And at this point, we don't have a single picked juror yet. Twelve of them are supposed to be designated at some point over the next few days. The judge gets to ask them questions, but so do uh, the defense and the prosecutor. And so far, there hasn't been a single one picked. Of course, this was always going to be difficult in a place like Manhattan, where there are a lot of Democrats and where most people will already have heard, of course, about the former president who grew up here in New York City, after all. One thing we learned today is that things move slowly in court, if that's not something we knew already. Uh, court has just adjourned for the day. These are going to be long days from 9.30 in the morning until 4.30 in the evening and as I just mentioned six weeks altogether for the trial but judging by what we saw today it's going to take quite a few days most likely to find that pool of jur jurors those 12 people who will decide whether to find Donald Trump guilty or not guilty. Phil tell us a little bit more about the scene today outside of the courthouse uh, were there protests what, what, what was it like? Yeah, there were some protesters here, not too many, though, a few dozen, I would say, at the start of the day, around 9 a.m., pro-Trump supporters this, and in a rarity for New York City, there were actually more supporters of the former president than opponents of his. Maybe there is a bit of tiredness creeping in uh, with all of these trials, uh, or rather these court cases going on uh, at the same time. It's been a quiet day uh, here outside the courthouse, no confrontations at all, bar one or two verbal ones, a lot of media here, of course, you're only seeing me, but to my left and to my right, there are dozens more reporters and camera crews. There is, of course, a huge amount of interest uh, in the first criminal trial for a former U.S. president. This is historic, and all of these days will be when the first jurors are picked, when opening arguments begin, when closing arguments take place, and, of course, when a verdict is decided upon uh, by the jurors. It is all pretty unprecedented, and as you mentioned off the top, it is a day that goes down in history. Phil, almost out of time, but quickly tell us about the former president. What was his demeanor like today, and how is he going to balance being in the courtroom as well as being on the campaign trail? Well, it's a good question. First of all, he will campaign a little bit here in New York because he does speak or 
is expected to speak before each day in court, and he did so today and also spoke just a few minutes ago once court had adjourned. So he will get some time in front of the cameras here in New York City. But essentially what he's looking at is being in court, and he has to be in court during the daytime, and then campaigning in the evenings, giving him also Wednesdays off because court won't be in session to campaign for president and also the weekends. But yes, for the next few weeks, six weeks at least, I would say at this point, it is going to be a case of uh, juggling those two priorities for Donald Trump. Now, Philip Crowther in New York for us tonight. Thank you so much. Our President Joe Biden condemns Iran's attacks and says the United States will continue to defend Israel. He is also speaking with world leaders about the best way to keep the conflict from spreading. When news of the Iranian attack against Israel first surfaced, President Joe Biden cut his weekend short and rushed back to the White House. A White House photograph shows him meeting with his national security team in the Situation Room. The president believes that what happened Saturday night was an extraordinary military success uh, and that it proved Israel is not alone and it proved that Israel has a military superiority it can be proud of. The president called it an unprecedented air attack against military facilities in Israel. And he gave his credit to U.S. troops for helping Israel defend itself. The president later called American forces to thank them. We made an enormous difference, potentially saving a lot of lives. And thanks to extraordinary skill, the United States helped Israel take down nearly all those incoming missiles. The president also held calls with Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, Jordan's King Abdullah, and other world leaders in the G7 to coordinate their response. They also condemned Iran's attack, writing, Iran has further stepped toward the destabilization of the region and risked provoking an uncontrollable regional escalation. This must be avoided. Of course, we are, uh, continue to make clear to everyone that we talk to that we want to see de-escalation, de that we don't want to see this conflict further escalated. We don't want to see a wider regional war. And now, in the midst of the chaos, President Biden hosted the prime minister of Iraq at the White House. The war in the Middle East only making their conversation more important. Our partnership is pivotal for our nations, for the Middle East, and I believe for the world. The president also welcomed another world leader for talks at the White House, the prime minister of the Czech Republic. Together, we're deepening our defense cooperation and ensure the security of our people. After more on this developing situation, we go to Sam Mednick with the Associated Press, who is in Jerusalem tonight for us. Sam, good to see you. So give us a sense of how things are on the ground right now. How are people there feeling in what no doubt can be described as a tinderbox situation? Well, the situation, the tensions are still rising, but people do feel a little bit more relieved and alleviated after the weekend's attacks. But now the question is, what is Israel going to do in terms of a response? And on Monday, Israel did say that it was going to respond. Its chief of staff said that they were still figuring out the next steps and didn't give a lot of details but said that a response was coming. And this is after days of discussions with the war cabinet about what it was going to do. Israeli local media did say that a response would likely inflict pain, according to the war cabinet, but that it wasn't going to trigger a wider war. And that is what we're kind of waiting to see right now in terms of what kind of response there's going to be. But there's a lot of pressure right now for the situation to de-escalate. Yeah, and Sam, there are reports that uh, President Biden dissuaded Prime Minister Netanyahu from retaliating uh, this weekend. What more do you know about that phone call and also the relationship between the two leaders right now? Well, that's right. Biden and Netanyahu had a call, but right after the attacks early, early Sunday. And Biden did commend Netanyahu and Israel's remarkable ability to defend the country and also told Netanyahu to take the win and basically not to escalate the situation. The United States has said that it is not going to participate in an offensive if Israel does. Now, the two countries have been at loggerheads, particularly over Netanyahu's handling of the war in Gaza. This attack from Iran 
United States said that it was going to have ironclad support and it put its support behind Israel. But there are still these divisions over how Israel's handling of the war in Gaza. And it's unclear if Netanyahu is going to heed Biden's remarks. It's already said that they're going to retaliate against Iran. So it's unclear going forward if the United States is going to have that influence over Israel to de-escalate things or if Israel is going to go ahead as it wants. And Sam, finally, I want to turn now to the humanitarian situation. Uh, what is it like there in Gaza? And uh, much more aid is reportedly pouring in, yet there is still the threat on Rafa. What's the latest there? The situation on Rafa and Gaza is continuing. The war is continuing. There was a strike today in the middle of Gaza. The the Ministry of Health said that there were 68 bodies that were brought in to hospitals. You could see smoke from one of the hospitals in central Gaza. And there is still this threat of an invasion into the southern city of Rafah. Israel called up two brigades on Sunday, and it said that it is going to go into Rafah to eliminate the remaining Hamas battalions. There's about a million and a half people in Rafah. Israel says it's going to evacuate them, but it's really unclear where they're supposed to go. Much of Gaza has been reduced to rubble, but people in Gaza and Rafah are trying to get to their homes. At least five people were killed on Sunday trying to get to the north of Gaza. They're trying to check on their families and their houses. But Israel has said that they're not letting people go north because it's dangerous. But people are becoming frustrated and exacerbated as this war is continuing. Sam Mednick reporting from Jerusalem tonight. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. All right, news of Iran's missile attack on Israel echoed in the halls of Congress. Lawmakers are feeling the pressure to act on Israel aid and bring new sanctions against Iran. But... At what price? Capitol Hill correspondent Eric Rosales joins us now with the latest. Eric. Good evening, Tracy. The Republican-led House has completely changed its legislative schedule this week. Now lawmakers are concentrating on more than a dozen bills related to Iran's attack on Israel. But House Speaker Mike Johnson hasn't yet announced a former Israeli aid bill. We are expecting an announcement after the GOP conference meeting, and Democrats are also meeting as well. Meanwhile, senators are urging the House to act quickly. If House Republicans put the Senate supplemental on the floor, I would believe it would pass today, reach the president's desk tonight, and Israel would get the aid it needs by tomorrow. It's time for the commander in chief to lead allies and partners in an international effort to impose meaningful costs on Iran. I do believe we need to move as quickly as possible. So however Speaker Johnson can get this across the finish line, he should. Iraq War combat veteran Senator Joni Ernst says aid for Israel must include funds for Ukraine and Taiwan as well. Israel is our partner. Uh, we know that Iran targets not only Israel, but American soldiers throughout the Middle East. When it comes to Ukraine, they're kind of that final buffer between Russia and NATO. And of course, China, they are everywhere, but we need to enhance our presence in, in Taiwan. It would be most appropriate for the Congress to do in response is for Speaker Johnson to put on the floor tomorrow the supplemental that was passed by the Senate by a broad bipartisan majority and promptly send it to President Biden. That will send a strong signal. But some senators have doubts about funding all three. I think Israel is a much closer ally, is a much more core American national security interest. And of course, we've got to focus on ourselves. That means encouraging the Ukrainians to take a defensive strategy. We've got to focus on our core problems. I think Israel is much more important to the United States than Ukraine is. I don't understand where my colleague Vance has about Ukraine as well, too. In fact, he owns in my opinion, the dumbest thing I've ever heard about Ukraine, where he claims to some effect that he doesn't care what happens in Ukraine. And that, that's astonishing to me. California Congressman uh, Ro Kahana and 56 uh, other Democratic lawmakers wrote President Biden. They want him to put restrictions on whatever American tax dollars or ammunition that's sent to Israel. We need to have defensive weapons to Israel so that they don't face an attack from Iran, but we cannot be giving them more offensive weapons when over 30,000 people in Gaza have died, many women and children. And what about the anti-Israeli protests taking place across the country like today's, which shut down the Golden Gate Bridge? Well, the protesters have a right in this country. I mean, we have a strong tradition of marches across bridges from John Lewis. Uh, but what I would say is the most effective protests are ones uh, outside uh, U.S. Capitol offices, the State Department, uh, to galvanize uh, opinion. A very interesting point came from Florida Senator Marco Rubio today. He says Iran knows that it doesn't have the military might 
against Israel, but it just wants to make Israel an unbearable place to live. Tracy. Well, Eric, I know you're also following other topics that are making headlines on the Hill right now. Tell us about that. Well, that is correct. Uh, let's talk about the articles of impeachment against DHS Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas. Uh, they're going to be coming over from the House over to the Senate tomorrow afternoon. And Majority Leader Chuck Schumer is yet to announce if he will actually bring them to the floor for a vote or if he's going to try and dismiss them. Also, you may recall the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Bill, also known as FISA. Well, it must pass the Senate sometime this week before the April 19th deadline. And intelligence officials have said FISA is vital to fighting terrorism both here and abroad. But several lawmakers are trying to stop it. They're saying that reforms don't go far enough and that the FBI and other federal law enforcement agencies have already violated America's rights with FISA, including the former president, Donald Trump, when they investigated the fake Russian dossier. At the Capitol, Eric Rosales, EWTN News Nightly. All right, thank you, Eric. And coming up later in the newscast, analysis of the Israel-Iran flare-up from a military standpoint. Well, here in the United States, the FBI has opened a criminal investigation into last month's bridge collapse in Baltimore. Officials say they will focus on the circumstances leading up to the collapse. They're also probing whether all federal laws were followed. The news comes as the mayor of Baltimore announces a partnership with two law firms to, quote, hold wrongdoers responsible. And we have a lot more still to come here on EWTN News Nightly, including a church leader from New York is in the Holy Land. Cardinal Timothy Dolan shares his thoughts on the war in the Middle East. And we give you the latest as police apprehend a suspect in connection with a stabbing in a church in Australia. Welcome back. We continue our coverage on the situation in the Middle East as Israel ponders how and when to hit back against Iran for its drone attack over the weekend. European allies, including the United Kingdom, Germany and France, are all urging Israel not to retaliate against Tehran. Meantime, the United States is also advising Israel not to respond militarily. And if it does, Israel, it says, will have to go it alone. This despite what the Biden administration describes as its ironclad relationship with Israel. And joining us now is Robert Moret, professor of international affairs at Syracuse University and a retired Navy intelligence officer. Professor, good to be with you today and thank you for your service. Um, Iran's attack on Israel, it, it really didn't come as a surprise as Tehran had been warning that it would strike. That said, it was the first time that it directly launched an attack from Iranian territory. What does this tell you? Well, it tells us that, you know, we have to be very concerned about the um, potential for an escalation throughout the region. And uh, as you alluded to earlier, the Israelis have already said that they will retaliate in some fashion, although it's unclear uh, the extent to which they would do so, whether it would be very selective and, um, you know, narrowly defined or something more extensive than that. We'll find that out in the days and weeks ahead. Yeah, it, we will for sure. Um, you know, Fortunately, the drone attack was mostly thwarted by Israel's air defense system and with the help of the U.S. and other allies. Uh, still very significant what happened. Talk to us about how Iran was able to stage these attacks and what about their capabilities in the future? It was actually, it was a lot more than drones, as you know. It was a very complicated uh, attack by more than 300 uh, aerial platforms to include um, drones, as you say, but also cruise missiles and also perhaps most uh, acutely the ballistic missiles that were fired from both Iran and also uh, Yemen um, uh, from a military standpoint as somebody who was in the military for about 35 years the, the uh, defenses were, were extraordinary and I think what happened um, yesterday in terms of the attacks will be studied for years by people that are involved in air defense because of the uh, tremendous capability that was exercised, and all the different international partners that were involved. It's just a very, very complicated defensive operation, but one that was extremely successful, and uh, we ought to commend all the forces that were involved in that. Yeah, and Robert, um, as we know, Israel said it will do something. We just don't know when that will be and what exactly will happen, how they are going to respond um, to Iran. But how do you think they should respond? What do you think they should be doing? Yeah, I would hope that it would be selective and non-escalatory, and that's kind of a narrow 
Uh, you have to thread that needle, which isn't always easy. Uh, it may be something that goes after uh, either Iranian surrogates in the region or potentially something on the Iranian main, mainland, and that'll uh, be a, a different category, uh, depending upon how they decide to do it. Uh, we would hope that it would be something that would allow the uh, Israelis to have some kind of response, but at the same time, kind of, uh, you know, not result in an additional tit for tat and an open ended back and forth between the two countries, especially because of all the interests that we and all the other countries that are allies in the region have, like the Jordanians, the Gulf states, the Saudis, and so on and so on. The Iraqis, we mentioned, were uh, represented here in Washington today. So we have a lot of interests and other friends in the region we have to look after. Israel certainly, we would hope for uh, something that would be non escalatory. Yeah, we're praying for that for sure. Well, Professor Robert Murat, thank you so much for coming on and for your analysis. We really appreciate it. Enjoy talking with you. Have a good evening now. You as well. Well, the Archbishop of New York was visiting the Holy Land when Iran launched attacks on Israel. Cardinal Timothy Dolan says the answer to conflict is faith in God. The fear is, I mean, it's bad enough that the land called holy is, is blood and violence and tension. When that expands, then it is more, oh no, then it is more dangerous, then it is more threatening. So the answer is here. The answer is in the spirit. The answer is faith. The answer is to recognize we're all God's children. We all believe that, and that's what we need. Cardinal Dolan says most people that he's met during his visit to the Holy Land just want peace, something he says gives him great hope. On Saturday, he celebrated Mass alongside the Latin Patriarch of Jerusalem, Cardinal Pizzaballa. Pope Francis encourages the faithful to share their personal encounters with Christ. Ognuno di noi ha incontrato il Signore e facciamo fatica a parlarne. During a Sunday reflection at the Vatican, the Holy Father said to not lecture others, but instead to share unique moments in which we felt the Lord as alive and close to us. Pope Francis also made an appeal to halt the spiral of violence in the Middle East. EWTN Vatican News correspondent Colin Flynn has more. Good evening, Tracy. With Iran's attack on Israel threatening to plunge the Middle East into a deeper conflict, Pope Francis has issued a heartfelt plea to both sides. He asked them to halt, quote, every action that could create a violent spiral and destroy the Middle East in a bigger conflict. No one, he said, should threaten another person's existence. But the fight isn't just between Iran and Israel, it is also the war between Israel and Hamas and the dire humanitarian crisis in Gaza. During yesterday's Regina Celi here at the Vatican, Pope Francis said he invited every nation to, quote, join the call for peace and help the Israeli and Palestinians to live in two states. Speaking from the Apostolic Palace to the crowd who had gathered in St. Peter's Square behind me, the Pope repeated once again, quote, two states neighboring each other. Pope Francis concluded this part of his speech by calling for a ceasefire in Gaza and the freeing of hostages. Here is that powerful moment. Stop war, stop attacks, stop violence. Yes to dialogue and yes to peace. Unfortunately, that wasn't the only tragic event over the weekend. Six people died in a horrific knife attack at a shopping mall in Sydney. And the Vatican Secretary of State, Cardinal Pietro Parolin, conveyed the Pope's deep sadness in a telegram to the Archbishop of Sydney. The Holy Father called it a senseless tragedy and assured his spiritual closeness to those affected. He offered his prayers for those who were killed, those who were injured, and the first responders who worked to save their lives. In the telegram, he said, quote, he evoked upon the nation the divine blessing of consolation and strength. In Rome, Colm Flynn, EWTN News Nightly. In a disturbing turn of events in Sydney, Australia, another knife attack happened today, this time at a church. A suspect is under arrest for allegedly stabbing a bishop and churchgoers during a televised service. Thankfully, none of the injuries seem to be life-threatening. Police have not disclosed a motive for the attack, this coming only days after the stabbings at a Sydney mall. The attack drew condemnation from the city's religious communities and calls for calm 
from authorities. While thousands of pro-lifers in Poland took to the streets to protest recent steps by lawmakers to move ahead on measures that would make abortions easier to obtain. The pro-life march yesterday was part of a day of prayer in defense of conceived life. The country's Catholic bishops supported the rally. Lawmakers last week voted to approve further consideration on four proposals to lift the near total ban on abortions. Up next on EWTN News Nightly, five years later, signs of hope on the anniversary of the fire at one of the world's most well-known churches. Plus, find out who the winner of the Masters thanked after his victory this weekend. Today marks five years since the devastating fire at Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris. Visitors and locals alike are eagerly anticipating the reopening of the church later this year. Shortly after the fire, French President Emmanuel Macron announced that the cathedral would be rebuilt within five years. The original building and its architecture will be restored as part of the project. The cathedral is set to reopen this December. Well, finally tonight, Scotty Scheffler won the Masters Golf Tournament in Georgia on Sunday. He was quick to point to the reason for his success, and no, it was not his golf clubs or his caddy. The top-ranked player in the world instead credited his Christian faith, saying, quote, I have been given a gift of this talent, and I use it for God's glory. That's pretty much it. Scheffler also said that he is eager to return to his home in Texas, where he and his wife are expecting their first child. God bless them. Also yesterday, Neil Shipley, the graduate of Central Catholic High School in Pittsburgh, who used a fellow Central Catholic grad at his caddy, finished with the lowest score among amateurs. Shipley was able to play the final round with legendary golfer Tiger Woods. Anyway, thank you for watching tonight. And remember, you can follow us on social media, Facebook, X, and Instagram at EWTN News Nightly. I'm Tracy Sable. Good night and God bless.